Welcome back, everybody. We've been covering this chapter on conformity, and we've been talking about compliance. Let's finish up that discussion of compliance by talking about some sequential request strategies for gaining compliance. You might recall that compliance refers to changes in our behavior that are elicited by direct requests. So a request something like, can I borrow $50? Well, instead of just asking for that $50 all at once, sometimes it's better to take a two-step approach when trying to gain compliance in that situation. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this section, what we call two-step sequential request strategies for gaining compliance. We'll talk about the foot in the door technique, the door in the face technique, the that's not all technique, and lowballing. You'll see that the foot in the door technique and lowballing work in a similar way, just as the door in the face technique and the that's not all effect also work in a similar way. So we'll discuss each one of those pairs in tandem. Let's start off by talking about lowballing and the foot in the door technique. The foot in the door technique is a two-step compliance strategy where a person sets the stage for their real request by first asking the person to comply with some much smaller request. So for example, let's say I need 50 bucks and I'm interested in asking you for 50 bucks. I might start off by first asking you for only 10 bucks. And here's the reason why. After some initial small request, like 10 bucks, the odds increase that my second larger request for 50 bucks will be more successful. You'll be more likely to give it to me. So in the real world, it would probably work like this. I'd say like, hey, how you doing? You know, I'm really strapped this month. Would you mind loaning me 10 bucks? I've got some bills I've got to pay. And you'd be like, yeah, that's no big deal. You know, here's 10 bucks. And you'd go into your wallet, you'd start getting the money for me. And I'd say, you know, now that I think about it, 10 bucks really isn't gonna cover it. Is it all right if you just give me 50 bucks and then I'll pay you back next month? The bottom line is, according to this foot in the door technique, you are more likely to comply with my request for $50 if I first asked you for $10. Well, the question is, why does this tend to be successful? To some extent, we all desire to be consistent. If I just agreed to help you out by giving you $10, well, then I'm a helpful person. I must like you. You're my friend. It just seems completely consistent that when you ask for a somewhat larger request, $50, I'm gonna help you out again. And that's at least in part due to this motivation I have to continue seeing myself as a helpful person. I mean, just think about how awkward that situation would be if you asked me for $10 and I'm like, sure. And then 20 seconds later, you realize you need a little bit more money and you ask me for 50 and now I'm shutting you down. So I wanna to continue to see myself as a helpful person. I want my behaviors to be consistent. I don't want to be seen as wishy-washy. And that's one reason that the foot in the door technique is successful. So you can see with the foot in the door technique, the person's requests shift from relatively small to relatively large. Well, the same type of thing is working with lowballing. It's based on the same type of shift from a relatively small request to a relatively large request. The way that lowballing works is that after someone agrees to some initial relatively small deal, they're then more likely to agree to some second more expensive deal after some hidden costs or hidden fees are then added to that deal. Let me walk you through a situation that I went through myself. I was interested in buying a used truck. It's really hard to find a good used truck, so I did a lot of research, and I finally found this truck posted online. And I went to the dealership and I test drove the truck and I really liked it and I really liked the price and I was, I was ready to pay them every penny of that price. So the salesman and I essentially had a deal. He went and got the, the uh, sales manager. The sales manager came back and he lowballed me. How did he lowball me? He said, you know what, something's come up. There's been a mistake and we're gonna need to put a little bit of money into that truck to make it to the standards that we really wanted and I'm not gonna be able to discount it like that and I'm gonna to need to sell it to you for this number right here. And it also turned out that because the truck was a 2002, it did not qualify for the exchange policy, for the money back guarantee, nor for the warranty. So I went in there to buy a truck for about eight grand and that relatively small deal that we agreed upon turned into a relatively expensive deal, which of course I did not agree to. 
because I knew what was happening. I was being lowballed. So why is it that some people in this situation are indeed now more likely to pay that price after they had first been offered this relatively lower price? Why is it that after being offered that relatively lower price, that lower deal, they are now more likely to pay this more expensive price for that more expensive deal? Well, it's kind of interesting. To some extent, people become committed to that deal. And in fact, I was pretty darn committed to that deal. I told you, it sucks looking around trying to find a good used truck, and that was a good used truck. And as I was driving it on that test drive, I'm thinking about myself driving it home. I'm thinking about driving it to work. I'm thinking about how happy I am with that truck. I was married to that truck at that point. I became committed to that sale. Now, because I was able to recognize that lowballing was going on, I got pissed off. So, of course, I was not going to go through with that deal. But a lot of people, they don't notice what's going on and they don't have that type of negative reaction. And because they became so committed to buying that truck, they were willing to spend a little bit of extra money. So in that case, that two-step sequential strategy worked in the dealer's favor. So what I hope you're noticing here is with the foot-in-the-door technique and with lowballing, they both shift from a relatively small request to a relatively large request. And the whole point is, People are more successful in gaining compliance to that large request when it is preceded by that small request. Next, let's talk about the door in the face technique and the that's not all technique because those two techniques use a similar two-step sequential strategy. The door in the face technique is another two-step technique, just like all the techniques we're talking about. But this one begins with an initial large request, one that is likely to simply be rejected. And it's followed up by a smaller request that is then much more likely to succeed. So it might work this way. Let's say again, I need $50 from you. I'm not gonna begin just by asking you for $50. I might begin by asking you for $500. And that's a lot of money for anybody. So you're likely to say, I'm sorry, I'd, I'd love to be able to help you, but I just cannot afford to give you $500. And I'd say, all right, I understand, but I'm really strapped. Could you loan me at least 50? And in that situation, you are more likely to give me $50 than if I were to ask you for $50 right from the start. Why is that? Why would that work? Well, to some extent, there's a contrast effect going on. In comparison, that second request for $50 seems so much more reasonable than that request for $500. And due to the norm of reciprocity, we are also often committed to making reciprocal concessions. So think about the concessions I made. Initially, I asked you for $500, and then I tried to help you out. I, I said, hey, all right, I know that's a lot to ask of you. Uh, I'm going to bring it down to $50. Can you please help me out by giving me $50? Well, because I made a concession, now you're going to feel some obligation to make a concession as well. I shifted from $500 to $50. Now I want you to shift from no to saying yes. And you're going to feel, due to that norm of reciprocity, a little bit of pressure to do so. And that's why this technique is successful. The that's not all technique is based on a similar shift from a large request to a small request. Here's how this technique works. After some initial inflated deal is simply bound to be rejected by someone, then a second much more reasonable deal is offered with discounts and bonuses to make it seem much more attractive. And my point is that that second, more reasonable deal is much more likely to be successful if it's followed by that inflated deal that was first offered. Again, that's why we call these two-step sequential strategies for compliance. So let me give you an example, something that you've probably seen before. Do you remember seeing Sham Wow advertised on TV? It's a classic example of the, and that's not all effect. So here's the way it would work. They'd talk about this great product and they'd show you how it works. And a lot of people were interested because it seems like it's really a pretty good product. And they'd say for only $19.99, you can get these two large ShamWows and two mini ShamWows. Now, that actually seems like quite a bit to ask for. $19.99 for two large and two small ShamWows is more than most people want to pay. But that's not all. If you order now, you're going to get another set of two large and two small ShamWows. Now you're thinking to yourself like, hey, 
In comparison to that first deal, I'm now gonna get two sets of two large and two small sham wows. That's starting to sound pretty good. And then they'd say, and that's not all. If you order right now, you'll also get this free sham wow mop. And then you're thinking to yourself, wow, this, this deal's even gotten better. So you're contrasting it with that first deal. That first deal you would never jump on. But now it's been sweetened. You've gotten some extra discounts and some bonuses. And now comparatively, it looks so much better. I hope you're starting to notice some trends that explain why these techniques are successful. In this situation, the final deal that includes all these products at that price only looks like a good deal when we contrast it with the initial deal that included only a couple products for that same price. And in addition to that contrast effect, we're also noticing reciprocal concessions. Remember that norm of reciprocity? When someone does something nice for us, we typically feel pressure to do something nice in return. So let's go back. They did something nice for us. They initially wanted to sell us these products right here for $19.99, but then they added some more. And then they added some more product. So if they're making some concessions, they expect us to make some concessions. We feel that pressure. Well, what type of concession can we make? We're expected to shift from saying no to saying yes. So I'm sure you can see by now, in both of these situations, door in the face and the that's not all technique, the request shifted from a relatively larger request to a smaller, more reasonable request. And that smaller, more reasonable request was more likely to be complied with only after that larger initial request was denied. This table right here does a great job of organizing these techniques and providing some brief descriptions. All right, well, let's wrap this up by having a brief discussion of assertiveness, because keep in mind, you can try using these techniques, but you're not gonna always be successful. Sometimes people are gonna speak up, assert themselves, and say no. Remember, I was in that situation where I was being lowballed. I recognized what was going on, and I said, I'm gonna have nothing to do with this. So how can you use these techniques successfully? Well, one thing that you wanna keep in mind is you need to be slick. You can't be too obvious. If people understand that you're trying to use some technique on them, they're going to resist. Here's an example. Look at this comic and keep in mind that all that Calvin wants from the very beginning, all that Calvin wants is a cookie. But he begins by saying, mom, can I set fire to my bed mattress? And she's like, no. Well, can I ride my tricycle on the roof? No, Calvin. Then can I have a cookie? No, Calvin. And then Calvin's thinking she's on to me. This is a classic example of the door in the face technique, but Calvin was way too obvious in what he was trying to do. And his mom was assertive, which in this context means that she resisted social pressure. So these techniques work, but you can't let people understand that you're trying to use these techniques on them. That's just some basic common sense. Can you protect yourself from having these techniques used on you? Yeah, of course you can, but you need to be on the lookout. Remember, when I went into that car lot, I was familiar with lowballing. So I was able to see when they were trying to use it on me. And then I was assertive. I understood what was going on. I wanted to have nothing to do with that deal. So I simply said no. And here's another thing to really keep in mind. Try to resist pressure from the norm of reciprocity. Just because someone's offering you some concession, don't feel so pressured to offer a concession in return by shifting your no response to a yes response. If you can resist that norm of reciprocity, you will resist becoming a sucker. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.